Good to see each one this evening. We want everyone to feel welcome, and we would remind you of the question period. You might want to make some notes <clears throat> as we proceed. If you uh, have some questions about some of the things that are said, you don't have to agree with us. They don't have to be agreeable questions. Uh, we want the truth, and if we've made a mistake somewhere, someone pointed that out, I would be grateful. But we're talking about the scientific evidence as opposed to what we normally do from this pulpit, normally from God's Word, and that's what I prefer. But we find a great many people have been convinced that the Bible is not God's Word by science, and I think we need to learn to deal with that kind of evidence. We're talking this evening about the laws of science and the very fact that there are laws is significant. Where did they come from? <laughs> did they evolve? No. <laughs> we, we look at the laws that govern the light from this projector. It's an inverse square law. It didn't start out as a first power and then evolve to a second power. Uh, there are laws that are constant. They work in China. They work on the moon. Uh, as everywhere we've been able to test them. How did that happen? Well, I think that's supernatural. I think there was a lawgiver. Albert Einstein would certainly qualify as a qualified scientist. He says, we see a universe marvelously arranged and obeying certain laws. Uh, I think there's tremendous implication in that. We'll be looking at two of the laws that he goes on to talk about in this context. There are several laws of thermodynamics, but he speaks of them in general as classical thermodynamics. We'll be looking at the first two. And I know there are a lot of people who hear that word and their mind just clicks. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't, can't understand that. That's a big word. Uh, you understand the concept, maybe not the terminology, but the words you know very well, and I think you'll see that you're familiar with them. Um, but he says it's the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I'm convinced that it will never be overthrown. Albert Einstein thinks this is where I have the greatest confidence, really. Nothing is going to overthrow this. This is fundamental. And if you've got a theory contrary to it, I think that's a serious trouble, a serious problem. The first law of thermodynamics is often referred to as the law of conservation that tells us matter and energy can be interchanged, but neither can be created or destroyed. Um, scientists like to complicate it as in the way they express it. Basically, it means you can't get something from nothing. You didn't know that, did you? We all understand that. You can't create something out of nothing or make it totally disappear. You may burn it up, but it just, uh, the gas and the stuff is still there. It just changes form. Isaac Isomoff is one of the more prolific science writers of our time, though he did die just a few years ago. Wrote uh, over 60 books. Uh, and is often quoted as an authority in science, and we'll let him explain these laws to us. In other words, here's the, the enemy, the opposition, the atheist, who is explaining this to us. He's not going to overemphasize the problems. This law is considered the most powerful, most fundamental generalization about the universe scientists have ever been able to make. Now, scientists are very careful about making very general, flat-footed statements about everything, and uh, when they say something like this, that, that says something. It's the most powerful, the most fundamental generalization about the universe scientists have ever been able to make. No one knows why. He might speak for himself there. I think Christians got pretty good insight into why. But he says... All that anyone can say is that in over a century and a quarter of careful measurement, scientists have never been able to point to a definite violation. 
either in the familiar everyday surroundings about us or in the heavens above or the atoms within. I see our system here is not coordinated here. We got a little bit of adjustment, okay. Um, never a violation, whether you're talking about heavens or atoms, that's a broad span. It applies to all of that, but the evolutionist is trying to explain what we have, not by a creation, so how does he get the stuff that's here when you can't get something from nothing? You got to have something to get it from. Um, they have the principle of uniformity, which is uh, basically assuming the thing to be proved, the naturalist rule, saying that everything originated as a result of present laws. Well, the present laws say you can't originate <laughs> anything. You can't get something from nothing. So that's, that's kind of a problem. But that is the theory as opposed to the law. Uh, and we see Isaac Isimov beginning to wrestle with that. He said, where did the substance of the universe come from? Well, that's, if you're trying to explain this naturally and you can't get it, naturally, basically, is what the first law says. How do you do that? Well, it's interesting to watch him try. He says, perhaps in an infinite sea of nothingness, you got that? Sea of, <laughs> they're globs. Now, wait a minute. If you got globs, that doesn't sound like nothingness to me. <laughs> and when they talk about something from nothing, you'll see usually they're cheating, they're not, they're, they're fudging on you. They're positive and negative energy. Now, okay, now that's something, isn't it? That's not nothing. But they're globs of positive and negative energy and they're constantly forming, which you can't do according to first law. And uh, we're in one of the blobs in the period of time between nothing and nothing and wondering about it. Well, I can sympathize when he's trying to wrestle with a problem, and he's got a serious problem. The principle of uniformity says everything came into existence as a result of present laws, but the most fundamental generalization about the universe, he acknowledges, that we've ever been able to make says you can't do that. The law of conservation, the first law says nothing comes into existence that's not already here, and they're trying to explain everything as a result of present law as well. You've got the theory fighting with the law, and I think I know which one ought to win if you're a reasonable person. But they're telling us that nothing times nobody equals everything, and that's supposed to be science, even though the most fundamental generalization about the universe says no, no, no. Um, and we have number one bestseller on the New York uh, Best, uh, New York Times bestseller list, a universe from nothing. Uh, well, <laughs> that sounds like he's trying to answer the problem, and uh, you read the book, you find out he's, he's fudging, he's not starting with nothing, and uh, it's another illustration of the unanswerable problem that they have. I think G.K. Chesterton, who is uh, don't agree with everything he says, but he's a very good philosopher and a good thinker. And I think he's stated it very well. Now, he didn't state it simply, and you've got to put your thinking cap on to follow what he's saying here, but it's worth it. Let's see what he says. He says it's absurd for the evolutionist to complain that it's unthinkable for an admittedly unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing. Now, he, he admits, yeah, that's, that's a difficult thought, but it's absurd for the evolutionist to complain about that and then pretend that it's more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything, which they do. It's either everything came from God or everything came from nothing. 
Now, everything came from God. That, yeah, that's uh, not easy because we haven't seen that, but I'm nothing. And that's the only alternative. You, that's the way it stacks up. And the first law says you can't have the second one. Uh, God is outside of those laws. The second law of thermodynamics is equally and even more a problem for the naturalist. It's the principle, we're told, of entropy increase. And again, here's uh, scientists like to say it in a complex way, and it's really upside down. Entropy is the measure of disorder, and so it's more disordered, and so the entropy increases. Sounds backwards, but it says it's all going downhill. Did y'all know that? <laughs> we, we understand that well. Let's let Isomoff, the famous atheist, explain that for us. He says, another way of stating the second law then is the universe is constantly getting more disorderly. Viewed that way, we can see the second law all about us. Uh, we have to work hard to straighten the room, but left to itself, it becomes a mess again very quickly, very easily. Even if we never enter it, it becomes dusty and musty. How difficult to maintain houses, machinery, our own bodies in perfect working order. How easy to let them deteriorate. Anybody relate to that? We understand that very well, don't we? In fact, all we have to do is nothing, and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out all by itself. You don't have to work at it just works that way. Uh, that's what the second law is all about. We look at houses and over the years that house gets brighter and shinier and an extra bedroom <laughs> or the opposite. We see it deteriorate. We can work to overcome that but it takes a lot of work. By itself it runs down and wears out. That's the second law of thermodynamics, it is the loss of order. And that's what we see. Science is about observation, and we see deterioration everywhere we look. Uh, Brother Harper understands what's going on here. Uh, that's not the way it looked when it came off the showroom floor. But what happened to it? time happened to it. Now, time is supposed to be <laughs> the, the solution for the evolutionist. Just throw time at it, and it solves the problems. Time is the problem, not the solution. And I think that's a very eloquent refutation of the idea that time solves the problem for the evolutionist. The evolutionist tells us everything's going uphill. It's the opposite of what we see which is what science is about, that more and more complex things are evolving continually, whereas the principle of entropy increase, the law, the second law of thermodynamics says, no, it's going in the opposite direction, and we see that happening. So <laughs> at this point, you, you could say, well, the ball game's over. Let's go home. That, that's the obvious answer is you can't have evolution. Well, but there are objections and we need to look at those and when we present this on college campus there's always this objection and we need to know how to respond to that. We have surplus energy from the sun and that surplus energy then is able to overpower. You can make things go uphill. You can make water go uphill with a pump and some energy and designed uh, apparatus. You see the acorn uh, absorbing the energy from the sun and it increases, doesn't it? Goes uphill. So the source of energy is the sun. We can see that and that bathes uh, the earth in this extra energy and that's the solution, you see. We, we don't have to worry about the second law of thermodynamics because we've got extra energy from the sun. And that may sound like a, a pretty good response. There's, I think, a very obvious answer when we think about it. 
yes, surplus energy is necessary anytime you have an uphill process, but it's not a sufficient answer. It takes more than extra energy. Notice the statement by Simpson and Beck, Harvard, in their biology textbook. The simple expenditure of energy is not sufficient to develop and maintain order. Now, if we think about that, we understand it. He says a bull in a china shop performs work, but he neither creates nor maintains organization. Right? Yeah, he, he's got lots of energy, but that's not going to help the order of the situation, is it? The work needed is particular work. It must follow specifications. It requires information on how to proceed. And there's the rub. Where did the information come from? Energy, yep, we need that. We've got that from the sun. They've answered that part. The other part is that it requires information. And that part, they got no answer. And there's a tremendous amount of information involved when we look at living systems. Carl Sagan, the famous atheist, is talking about, and this is a 30-year-old statement. It's been multiplied since then. But in the Encyclopedia Britannica, he says the information content of a simple cell is estimated at around 10 to the 12th bits. Not 12 zeros after it. Um, he says that's comparable to about 100 million pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, that, that's a pretty good reading assignment, isn't it? 100 million pages. That would be a stack of books over a mile high. And that's in the simple cell, according to Carl Sagan, 30 years ago. And it's gotten worse to somewhat update it. Here's an article from Science that talks about half a million DVDs in your DNA. A single gram of DNA would hold 2.2 million gigabits of information about what you can store on 468,000 DVDs. Now, a DVD holds a lot of information, doesn't it? 468, that's a single gram of DNA. Now, how many DVDs would that be? Well, you stack them up, it's about two football fields taller than the Empire State Building. In a single gram of DNA. Okay, now that's, that's quite a test to explain where the information came from. And they've got zero answer. You could state it this way, the Empire State Building actually has about 10 million uh, bricks. The bricks, uh, we've gotten some challenges here. If, uh, I don't know how that adjusted itself. Um, but the average mammalian cell contains about 10 billion protein molecules as opposed to 10 million bricks in the Empire State Building. 10 million bricks, well, okay, yeah, the Empire State, <laughs> that takes a lot of information to put that together, but nothing like what you've got in this average mammalian cell. Uh, let's look at it this way. We've, we're familiar with the SETI project. It's looking into outer space, looking for some indication of intelligent life some signal, some little dot, dash, dot, dash, some information. And if you see ordered sequences of dots and dashes and dots and dashes from outer space, boy, you would have headlines around the world. How much information would you need? Well, just a few little ordered sequences, and that would say, here's proof of intelligent life in outer space. Well, let's just look in the other direction down the microscope and we see John loves Mary. <laughs> That's not a lot of information, but we know that that proves intelligence. And instead, let's look at the 2.2 million gigabits of information, that which is taller than the Empire State Building if you stack it onto DVDs, and you don't see any intelligence there 
a few little dots and dashes over here looking up, yep, that's intelligence. 2.2 million gigabits looking down and nope, no intelligence. Now, does that make sense to you? I think that just illustrates the complete total blindness of those who refuse to see the obvious. Information is really one of the ways to deal with this and, and one of the critical areas that show the fallacies of the evolutionist. God knows Mary's enough information to show the point, but this is a whole lot more. And when you look at mutations, this is supposed to be the means by which you go onward and upward, which is actually a decrease in information. And the main problem is how do they get the amount involved? But you see in a, a problem in the copying mechanism that doesn't uh, copy the information precisely and so you've got a mutation. That's downhill. Uh, I was doing a presentation uh, in Austin before the state textbook committee and they were asking myself and the head of the biology department there at the University of Texas to present the two uh, sides and they asked Dr. Bishop, the head of the biology department, give me an example of an increase in, uh, in information, a, a mutation that, that goes uphill. How, how, <laughs> give me an example of evolution. We ought to be able to see that. Well, he said, you look at the Texas salamander and he has adapted in the cave, lost the pigmentation, lost his eyes, and he's adapted, adapted to his environment. And so they said, well, Dr. Patton, how would you respond to this? Well, <laughs> that's a downhill process. He lost his eyes. <laughs> he lost his pigmentation. I said, now, if he comes up with a headlight down there, that would be evolution. <laughs> but he's going in the wrong direction. This is a decrease, and that's what mutations do. But somebody ought to have an answer. Maybe Bishop didn't, but uh, what would uh, Richard Dawkins of Oxford, the leading evolutionist, a spokesman for evolution, I'm going to let you listen to him and see what he says. Now, I'm going to have to explain the clip that we're going to be showing here. Uh, because he was asked a question, and it stumped him. And it, I think you... <laughs> That's my assessment. You can make your own. That's what it looks like. He he had no way to answer it. In fact, he we were doing the recording, and he just said, you have to turn this off. And we turned it off while he thought up an answer. And then he got the answer, and he said, all right, now then turn it back on. And he answered, and you'll decide for yourself whether or not he answered. But the question was, where's a mutation that shows an increase in information? Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? There's a popular misunderstanding of evolution which says that uh, fish turned into reptiles and reptiles turned into mammals and, and so somehow we ought to be able to look around the world today and look and look at our ancestors. We ought to be able to, to see the intermediates between fish and reptiles or between reptiles and mammals. We ought to be able to see fish kind of on the way to becoming reptiles. But of course that's not the way it is at all. Fish are modern animals. They're just as modern as we are. They're descended from ancestors which we're descended from way back 300 million years ago there would have been an ancestor which was the ancestor of modern fish and the ancestor of uh, of modern modern humans and that ancestor if you could have been there then you could have seen the first steps towards a fish uh say coming out onto the onto the land and, be, and becoming um becoming a, something like an amphibian but that was a long time ago you wouldn't expect to see that today now did you hear the example that we can see of an increase in information that we observe. Uh, 
that's after he has time to think about it, when <laughs> he's obviously stumped. It simply dramatizes, illustrates, yes, we've got information, we've got the source of energy. That, that uh, is not the problem. The problem is what's the source of information? And they have no answer. I've asked that question at universities all across the country, and the response is a very loud silence or tap dancing like you just listened to. It's not an answer at all. Um, so the second law says you go downhill. You've got to have an increase in information, and you know, they've got the energy. They don't have the information, which is necessary. Now, another illustration of this is with fossils. We're going to be talking about that, I believe, Thursday evening. But looking ahead just a little bit, in terms of what we see in the past, compared with what we see today, we see that downhill process illustrated in the fossil record, which I like to talk about. The evolutionists tell us everything is going uphill. And we see illustrations like this in the textbook. You've got modern monkeys and modern men. It's a very unscientific um, diagram, but that's that, we'll talk about that later. But they say life increased, and they say the horses increased, and that's not the case either, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the fossils. But that's not what you see when you look in the fossil record. That's what they tell you. Let me prove that. And let's just begin with a recent article. Here's 2019. Uh, referring to a sophisticated study of 15,484 land animals and birds. Now, here's a pretty extensive study, and they're, they're looking at the sizes and the, the increase or decrease, and they say, well, the species are disappearing. We're losing, some of them say, a species a day, but of this group, obviously, they're disappearing. Uh, biodiversity is disappearing. There is a downgrading of mammals and birds, so much so that they were able to predict that there's a 25% reduction that we'll be able to see in the next 100 years. It's going downhill in this sophisticated study where they actually measure that. Now, that's the picture that we see happening now, but the fossil record makes it even more obvious, I believe. Um, the horses were larger in the past, and that little chart goes the opposite direction. Here from geology, we read, mammalian life was richer in kinds of larger sizes, had a more abundant expression in the Pliocene than in later times. Uh, Pliocene, back in the fossil record, one of the very obvious demonstrations of that, you go back all the way to the 60s, and here is one of the icons, the, the heroes of evolution, Louis Leakey, and his work in the Avoir Gorge that we'll see, you'll see in all of the textbooks uh, in Africa. There's a pig as big as a rhino, and this is a fossil of it back in the, the Dakota School of Mines. Uh, the one on the right is the pig, <laughs> the fossil. Uh, obviously, much, much bigger. I mean, we know about pigs in Arkansas, don't we? <laughs> we hadn't seen one like that. Um, Leakey has been scouring the gorge since 1931. Uh, over the years, he's unearthed the bones of an ancient pig as big as a rhino, a six-foot-tall bird. Um, well... <laughs> I don't think Big Bird was around back then, but the elephant bird was, and it was about 12 feet tall. He also refers to <laughs> the rhino, the pig as big as a rhino. Well, how big were rhinos? Uh, 15 tons. Actually, we've got a glitch here. That's what was supposed to have come up. 20 feet tall, uh, 15 tons. <laughs> back to the article. Uh, of Louis Leakey, here's the ram compared to the modern ram today. Uh, I'm kind of glad those things are gone. Uh, 
but that's a pretty good sized ram that we see on the right, but nothing like what you see in the fossil record. But man, of course, we know. We look at the basketball games and we see people that are tall, but they've always been tall people. The Neanderthal wasn't uh, really tall, but he's taller than most of the people in the world today. Cro-Magnon, which was also contemporary with Neanderthal, averaged 6'6", six, six, which you learn about in graduate school. You wouldn't in undergrad. Um, we found two of them were over seven feet. But you look at the size of people around the world. Today in the U.S., it's, the average is 5'9.3". Well, that's a little bit taller than Neanderthal, less than Cro-Magnon. Um, but in India, the average is 5'5". Five, five. In China, it's 5'4.5". Five, five. In Iraq, it's 5'5.1". Five, five in Spain, it's 5'3.3". Neanderthal comes out pretty well compared with some of those. Um, and then we see in the fossil record Turkana boy, discovered by Richard Leakey, who is his son, 5'6". All right, that's not really big until you understand he was nine years old, which you can determine from the molars. Uh, Leakey is describing him National Geographic was surprisingly large compared with modern boys his age. The average today for a nine-year-old is 4.6. And the idea that <laughs> they were all smaller and we're getting bigger and bigger, that's not the picture of the fossil record. This is a donkey like what we excavated near Lubbock, Texas, that was named Ascentius gigantus, uh, nine feet tall at the shoulder, you compare that with modern donkeys, and um, nine feet is ridiculous compared to what we have today. About uh, a, lot, a little less than a mile from that site was another site where we were excavating the uh, bison that was 11 feet at the shoulder, 12 foot horn span. Now, the 12 foot horn span is impressive. Uh, compared with the six-foot man here. We see the cute little bunny that we uh, see bouncing around in our woods, but compared with the fossil record, there was the giant bunny, uh, much larger than what we have today, downhill to present-day size. I was at the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting in 1999 in Austin, Texas, where they announced the armadillo the size of an elephant. Uh, no, he didn't look like that, but he, he was an armadillo. They did compare him to the elephant. 4,000 pounds. Uh, we look here at the actual picture of the skull compared with the white one that's modern-day armadillo. That's not what they tell you in the textbook, is it? This appeared later that year in Science. Um, armadillo the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, that was the description in Science. Titana boa was described here in the BBC World News, that's a boa constrictor, uh, 50 feet long. Uh, that would uh, get some attention if we saw one slithering through the back door back there. But, uh, we see here the 18-foot anaconda vertebra. Now, that's, that would get some attention, too. That's a pretty good size anaconda. But pitiful compared to the giant titana boa, which they said would have been about 1.25 tons. Uh, we're looking here at camel bones. The dark one was the fossil compared with the modern camel bone found in 2005. My wife and I own a, a camel. Now, I can tell you, when you get up on that thing, you're a long ways up. And you better hold on tight because if you fall, <laughs> it's a long ways down. But in the fossil record, they were twice as big, as pointed out here in the BBC News, double the size. You're beginning to get the picture here. This is typical of what you see in the fossil record. 
Here is the shark that we see in the fossil record compared with Jaws, which was ferocious. Somebody with Photoshop did this to it and uh, <laughs> we'll give you an idea of what it looked like back then. Here in Science News, we have a description of mighty mouse, buffalo-sized rodent. You think you have large rats. <laughs> They're not buffalo-sized. And then the next, uh, well, two years later, we found uh, one even bigger than that. That one weighed a ton, the largest yet recorded, a one-ton rat. It would get your attention, wouldn't it? Uh, this is an article that appeared uh, to, uh, 2019. Uh, the dark colored bone is the jawbone of a lion. Uh, the lighter colored is both the skull and the jawbone, but that small jawbone is much smaller here in the uh, Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Approaching the size of a rhinoceros, it was gigantic, seven times larger than an adult lion. Kind of glad they're gone as well. But we're, I mean, it, it's just over and over and over you see this continually. Here in 2019, they're talking about an elephant sized ground sloth, and look up in the trees, you see today's size. There's some bigger, but nothing like the size of an elephant in the fossil record. Do you recognize this creature? Probably not. We don't see him that close range between five and ten times the size of modern day fleas. This is a flea <laughs> compared to the modern day flea. Ten times the size. Uh, I excavated a, a cockroach up in Ogblong, Illinois that was 18 inches long. Uh, Compared with our little cockroaches today, they're not, they don't sound, they don't look nearly as bad, do they? Are, are you getting the point? When you look at the fossil record, invariably it's the opposite of the lie that they've been telling us that we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's going in the opposite direction. And why would they lie about it? Well, they were trying to sell the idea of evolution and they cover up evidence like this. Here was a millipede that was found less than a year ago, uh, written in the Journal of Geologic Society, a 110 pound millipede over eight feet long. A scorpion, any of you ever been bitten by a scorpion? You would remember it if you did. I can testify to that. Don't recommend experimenting with that. This one was six and a half feet long compared with the little one today. That is a ferocious creature. <laughs> the little ones command a lot of respect. A six foot one, wow. Um, you've seen <laughs> the dragonflies. This one was from Kansas. Uh, 29 inch wingspan. Uh, here is the, one of the textbooks I was taught from describing it, saying in general all the Pennsylvanian in insects were larger. Pennsylvanian is where, <laughs> where the insects lived. I don't think it was a time period. I think it was an environment swamp. This is from the museum there in Kansas. Uh, here in Science Daily describing that. Why were prehistoric insects huge? recent study to help determine why once dramatically larger than they are today. They've been seen, we've seen remarkable reduction in size, which you've read about in your textbook, right? Or have you? That's not what they tell you, but that's what we see in reality. Here, uh, just a few years ago, the extinct New Zealand eagle may have eaten humans 10 feet, 10 foot wingspan, much larger. Uh, <laughs> giant penguins, seven feet tall, 250 pounds. Today, about four feet tall, about 100 pounds. 
here's a picture of a giant goose <laughs> doing battle with a dinosaur. Uh, lived on a Mediterranean island between six and nine million years ago, but biggest member of the duck, goose, swan family ever to have lived. Another one was found several years ago by Duke University. He was referred to as Duke's demon duck of doom. Uh, eight feet tall, over 500 pounds, may have been carnivorous, kind of reminds me of a scene. <laughs> I think we're missing our sound there, but that's all right. We can imagine what that sounded like. These are Arkansas cattails. You've seen those out in the swamp. They're how tall? Six, eight feet, maybe. Uh, in the fossil record, 120 feet tall. We've excavated several of these. They're fairly common compared to, man, that's, <laughs> that's nothing like what we see today. Seismosaurus was a huge dinosaur. This one we excavated up in Colorado, I helped to excavate, 177 feet long. Uh, those were big creatures. This building is not that long, I don't think. Uh, do we have any left? Well, they're all gone. Well, not actually. There is one remaining member of the big head family Beak neck family that is still alive today, the Tuatara from New Zealand. You can go over there and get your t shirt. It's the dinosaur's only living relative. They're about this size. See how much they have evolved. What's happened? Downhill dramatically. And that's what you see all the way through the fossil record, everywhere you look, in spite of the lies they tell you in the textbooks. I don't like that. I think science involves telling the truth. And these are facts that they acknowledge individually as long as you're not putting them in the textbook. But I don't think we ought to cover that up. It is a, now I can't prove that the downhill process of animals was because of the second law of thermodynamics. But that's what it looks like. I mean, everything's going downhill, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, so I'll tuck it in here <laughs> because it fits in that context. And it's not just with animals. We look at the earth itself, and what we see are downhill deteriorative processes. What's happening here? Is this <laughs> going downhill or uphill? We're told that there's about 127.5 billion tons of sediment eroded into the ocean each year, which we see happening here very dramatically. You can put gizmos in the mouths of rivers and multiply times the flow, and you can get a pretty reasonable estimate of how much is being dumped in the ocean. That's enough to fill a freight train that would reach all the way to the moon and halfway back. Every year, into the ocean, so how come we still got continents if this had been going on four and a half billion years? At that rate, and I think it was a much higher rate because of some catastrophic things like the flood, but at that rate it would last 60,000, which is a long, long ways from 4.5 billion. It fits our model a lot better. But it's a downhill process. We look up at the sky and <laughs> You hear about stellar evolution and galactic evolution and everything is forming and everything you see in the sky is exactly the opposite and dramatically so. On a good night you can watch the meteorites come flying down and meteor showers. Uh, what's happening there? Well something has come apart and is now burning itself up as it goes into the atmosphere. Is that uphill or downhill? Uh, little pieces that were together are now being burned up. We look at the surface of the moon and it's just been beat to death. 5,000 craters, we're told, uh, something's come apart and boom, crashed itself out of existence into the surface. 
Mercury here is described by NASA as a cratered inferno. And looking at it, yeah, that's just been, th this is a downhill process. And that's what we're seeing. We look at the hale mop comet, it's coming apart. That's what we see comets doing. How many of you have seen one form? <laughs> Nobody else has either. Uh, here, Fred Whipple, one of the leading authorities, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, says comets tend to split in pieces, particularly when they're near the sun or Jupiter, but also when they're undisturbed in space. Comets seem to tire out and die. Isn't that a surprise? <laughs> That's what we see in the world we live in. The most dramatic thing we see when we look up in the sky of the sun, which is radiating out, radiating out tremendous amounts of energy with thermonuclear reactions dissipating, we're told, about 4.5 million tons per minute, which is not helping the sun any. It's radiating, losing that much material, 4.5 million tons. Now, that's massive. It's not going to burn out tomorrow, but that's not helping it any. In addition, we have the solar prominences, which just blast out even more material. The solar wind streams out <laughs> a million tons or more. Uh, the solar flares blast out tremendous amounts of material. Here's one of the solar flares compared to the approximate size of the Earth. Boy, that's a big boom <laughs> and a lot of material. So just the normal stellar processes we're talking about 4.5 million tons. The solar wind, at least another million tons, not counting the flares and the prominences. Just millions and millions of tons per minute. That's what's happening to our sun, which is an average star. So, we see what's happening to the stars. We take this average star that's dissipating tremendous amounts and we multiply that times billions of billions. We're told now 700,000 billion billion. Now that's degeneration that is mind boggling and that's what we're seeing in spite of the propaganda that we hear. In addition to the normal stellar processes like our sun, which is dramatically downhill, we have planetary nebula, which blasts out 20 to 30 percent of the mass into the outer space around it. We have the novas and the supernovas, which just completely blast themselves out of existence, like the Crab Nebula. NASA says this is the mess left when a star explodes. Boom, <laughs> the sun is going downhill but every once in a while, some of them just blast themselves out of existence. That was actually observed in 1054 by the Chinese, Arabs, and Native Americans. This is like God's fireworks. Boom. And believe it or not, that happened on July the 4th, <laughs> 1054, according to the Chinese. Uh, and that's throughout the sky. Here is supernova remnant W49b. Notice NASA's description, a blinding flash in which the concentrated power equals that of 10 quadrillion suns. Suns, <laughs> that's amazing. 10 quadrillion times. Now that is degeneration with a vengeance. That's what we see in the sky. But where do the stars come from? Well, we hear them talk about birth of stars, but that's unobserved. I'm not sure how and why we're having some problems with our formatting here, but it didn't transfer. Well, we have to work on that. Uh, that's not observed. Notice what we see in science here uh, just a few years ago, we have yet to directly observe the process of stellar formation. We haven't seen a star form. 
in fact, we can't even make it work, we used to say, on paper. Now then, with the computer, uh, here at Arizona State University School of Space Exploration, no computer program has as yet fully been successful in creating a virtual star from realistic initial conditions. So we, we haven't observed it. We can't imagine it. We can't make it work on the computer. Now, when we think about what we ought to be able to observe, we're told there's 700,000 billion billion stars and that that formed over uh, 13.8 billion years. Okay, we know how fast that's forming. You divide one into the other, you got 1.6 million per second that ought to be forming. And we've never observed one. 1.6 million stars per second <laughs> for 13 billion years, and we never saw one. How believable is that? J.C. Brandit, who is uh, one of the leading astronomers in our country, his book, Sun and Stars, says con the condensation process is very difficult theoretically. You got gas and it condenses to become a star. No essential theoretical understanding is claimed to get, I mean, what happens when you turn gas loose from an aerosol can? It all comes together in a wad. <laughs> no, no, no. It spreads out. That's the law of physics. It's the evidence strongly argues against the possibility of this gas coming together. In fact, what we know about physics <laughs> it makes Godfrey Burnbridge's uh, statement. He's director of Kitt Peak National Observatory make sense. He says if stars did not exist, it would be very easy to prove this is what we expect. <laughs> because they're blowing themselves up, they're coming apart, and we can't make it even work on the computer to get them together, and the laws of physics say it ought to go this way, and you can measure the expansive rate from the laws of physics, and okay, you've got gravity that attracts, and you can measure that gravitational attraction, the expansive rate is 60 times the attractive rate of gravity. So what's going to happen? If the expansive rate is 60 times greater, it's going to expand. That's what he says. We, that's what we would expect. Theoretically impossible. George Mulfinger is different from the ones that we've been quoting from, all of whom are atheists. He is a creationist, has his doctorate in astronomy from Syracuse University. Passed away just recently. A very uh, interesting person to listen to. He said there are only three things wrong with our present view of star formation. Now, uh, again, I don't want to misrepresent that he is a, a creationist, very devout believer, but he understands what he's talking about, and he's right. He says the first problem is it's unscriptural. Genesis 2 verse 1 says the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And what does that say about new ones popping into existence? That's number one. Number two is we've never observed the star formation. That's a pretty good problem if you're trying to be a scientist. And number three, they're theoretically impossible. But he said apart from those three problems, it's a real winner. Stars we have problems with. Well, what about galaxies, which is a disk-like assemblage of hundreds of thousands of stars? Uh, think of uh, University of Durham is writing in science. He says, we're starting on a shaky foundation. We don't understand how a single star forms, yet we want to know how 10 billion stars form. <laughs> I'm not very sympathetic, but he, I, I can understand his problem. And then the galaxies rotate. And you see the, the arms here that would indicate a rotation. But what we learn from laws of physics, Kepler's third law, says that things that are further apart are not going to spin as fast as it. You've watched the ice skater. They pull their arms in, and they go much faster. Uh, 
same thing is happening here. The things that are more toward the center are going to go faster, so it will wind itself up. And it's been estimated it would wind itself up in at least three turns, but they're not wound up, and some of them have the straight bar in the center, and that bar wouldn't look like a bar <laughs> after half a turn. And we're talking about just a few tens of thousands of years, maybe a hundred, certainly not billions, and they don't look like they've been there that long. They haven't turned that often. Uh, their rotation should break them apart, according to NASA. Leading hypothesis to why these galaxies don't break apart is dark matter. Uh, that's something we haven't seen. These galaxies even are outspinning this breakup limit. Even, even imagining the dark matter doesn't help. But now then with the Hubble and with a brand new telescope, we're able to look at uh, and see even more, and the more we've seen, the more it's gotten. The, it's just multiplied their problems. <clears throat> the photo reveals a wide range of galaxies. Now, they're looking back, supposedly right back to the beginning, billions of years ago. Um, we won't talk about the theoretical aspects of that, but some of you have questions, we can. Um, Okay, we ought to look back. We ought to see baby stars right at the beginning. That's not what we see. A wide range from spirals that are Milky Way lookalikes, hazy reddish blobs. Gemini uh, Observatory depicted it this way. Here's the Big Bang over here on the left. And, okay, the gradually developing universe gets the more complex spiral galaxies over time. But the glaring question is, why are the galaxies in the young universe, why do they appear so mature? Right back at the beginning, they're just as mature as they were anywhere else, not the baby galaxies at all. Here from the news release, NASA, galaxy surprises astronomers, a massive, fast-spinning, disc-shaped galaxy so early I mean, now then, with the better telescopes, we can see back early, and oh, it doesn't look like it's early. Challenges the current understanding of how massive galaxies form. You, you look back at the beginning, you ought to see the beginning. It, it's this analogy. In fact, this analogy was referred to in science. You go to the nursery, you expect to see babies, right? When you go to the nursery and instead you see grandpas, you got a problem. <laughs> Something is wrong with the theory. And even that <laughs> is multiplied when we begin to think about the groups of galaxies. First, here's Treffel from George Mason University. There shouldn't be galaxies out there at all. <laughs> you can't get the star together. How do you get the groups of galaxies together when it's all supposed to go apart? Second law. <laughs> But not only shouldn't they be galaxies, they shouldn't be grouped. Stars are a problem. Groups of stars, galaxies are a problem. Now we've got groups of galaxies. And how in the world do you explain that? It's just multiplying the multiplication of the problem that they can't explain. We're told about our solar system and their earth science textbooks, and this is just... The gas condensed and formed what we got. <laughs> well, we could spend the whole evening talking about the problems, but just the most obvious is the sun, which has 99% of the mass of the solar system, compared with the planets, which have 99% of the angular momentum. In other words, the sun is just barely moving relative to the speed of the planets, which are just zipping around like crazy. 99% of the angular momentum all condensing out of the same cloud. Wait a minute. <laughs> you don't have to be an expert in celestial mechanics to understand that's not going to work. Uh, Ross Taylor, Lunar Planetary Institute, says the origin of our solar system's angular momentum remains obscure. How did these things get to going real fast when the great mass of the solar system barely moves at all relative to it? It just can't be explained with physics 
As Jeffries of Cambridge says, I think all suggested accounts of the origin of the solar system are subject to serious objections. The conclusion of the present state uh, of the subject would be, I'm oh, missing the tail end of that, would be it could not exist. Lissiter, likewise of the moon, says, all in all developing a theory of lunar origins that could make sense out of the data proved very difficult. Best explanation was observational error. The moon didn't exist. <laughs> if you're going to follow the physics, it shouldn't be there. Uh, so we, we look at the statements. If stars didn't exist, that's what we would expect. There shouldn't be galaxies. They shouldn't be grouped. The solar system cannot exist. The best explanation of the moon, it didn't exist. What can they explain? Their explanations don't work. Yet we're told, well, they understand it. Here's a very interesting observation here, 2019, of Geisler, professor of physics, astronomy at Dartmouth. He says, when you hear famous scientists making pronouncements like cosmology has explained the origin of the universe, that's complete nonsense. They can't explain stars. They can't explain the moon, explain the solar system, galaxies, groups of galaxies. Theoretically impossible, according to physics. So, as scientists, we compare models. We introduced that concept last night. Creation predicts degeneration that started in the garden. Things are going to go downhill, degenerate to death. But evolution says, no, everything's coming into existence as a result of present laws <laughs> evolving and getting more and more complex. We look at the world we live in and what's going on, which model fits best. We look at uh, the life of the past and see it was all bigger and it's going downhill. Which model fits best? We look at the solar system. We look at the world around us, things blowing up, not going up. They're going down. Which model fits best? If you're going to be an honest scientist, you go with the facts you're going to have to be a creationist. Notice the way that's assessed by Isaac Isimov, again, our atheist. As far as we know, all challenges are in the direction of increasing entropy, increasing disorder, or increasing randomness or running down. That's the second law. Yet the universe was once in a position from which it could run down. How did it get into that position? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> he didn't have an answer. He didn't try. It's up here. It was up here. It's How did it get up here? It didn't get up there naturally because the natural processes go this way. It had to be supernatural, didn't it? Which is really the point that H. Lipscomb is making. He is an atheist, professor of physics at Manchester. I think, however, we should go further than this and admit the only accepted ex uh, explanation is creation. That's anathema to physicists as it is to me, but we must not reject a theory that we do not like if the experimental evidence supports it. That's not just blind faith. That's experimental evidence supports the conclusion that creation is the only way to explain it. The people who wrote the textbook that I was taught from, that is taught from at most universities on thermodynamics, first year thermodynamics, are, are these men. And in the introduction to their book, they make a very brave statement. We see the second law of thermodynamics. These are the people that wrote the textbook, thermodynamics, uh, classical thermodynamics, name of the textbook. We see the second law of thermodynamics as a description of the prior and continuing work of the creator who also holds the answer to our future destiny and that of the universe. That's what physics tells us. That's what the laws of science say. Um, I think they're right. <laughs> and I think it's obvious and it's not a matter of 
opinion. It's a matter of fact that we can demonstrate. If you're here this evening and haven't confessed your faith, you're going to be lost without that. A book that tells us exactly how this world began and harmonizes with the facts of science says you need to confess your faith in Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the remission of sins. And we're going to stand and sing a song and encourage you to do that if you've not done so while we stand now.